Hi, and welcome to Econ 481. These videos were recorded while I taught the class over Zoom, but they were later edited so that the students' faces, their questions, and my answer to those questions do not appear. As a result, the videos are shorter than a normal lecture, and they may have unnatural transitions. But I hope you enjoy them anyway. Bye now. All right. So today, um, we are getting into our um, fifth lecture for uh, this first part of 481, and is the lecture that will conclude um, this first part. And um, I should say this, as I told you last time, this is a new lecture that I put together in the last couple of days that is based on some work in progress that I have now with Magna Moxter and Jack Mountjoy. But <clears throat> the idea wasn't, I didn't want to just present the paper. That's not what I'm doing. I wanted to sort of like give you an overview of um, what to do or what these outcome tests are, uh, which is not easy to do given that there are a lot of papers and so on. So I decided to structure it in a way that made sense in my mind. And then as I was writing the slides, I was uh, convinced that, you know, Perhaps I should do it with other changes in a different way. doesn't matter. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's just going to be something that will give you, hopefully, a sense of what this is about. Uh, but um, also have in mind that there could be typos in the slides because I wanted to use notation that was kind of like not too different from the paper that I'm going to present first and the paper that I'm going to present later. So I changed the notations of these papers. And then this working paper that I have here, we're doing massive changes. So even what we have in the paper, not really useful for what I'm doing today. So I had to change everything quickly. And I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Uh, worst case scenario, you lost two hours of your life, which is not that bad. And in my utility, your preferences doesn't end uh, not true. But um, anyway, let's get started. So um, where we are, we're concluding this first part uh, that we call on treatment effects and so on. And this is a bit of a stretch uh, in that sense, but it's you'll see that the topic today is at the end of the day is going to be and ended up being um, an application of uh, marginal treatment effects, growing models, and so on to a specific question. But the idea is that so far we cover selection of observables, Roy models, and late, and marginal treatment effects, and also discuss how we can extrapolate uh, these two other objects. And today we're going to talk about the so-called outcome test that, depending on the setting, should be implemented using uh, marginal treatment effects. And so what I decided to do is to sort of like um, have a discussion that. Um, highlights the difference between, you know, I'm going to call them average based outcome tests and marginal based outcome tests. Um, just to be clear, this is just some terminology I, I came up with. It's not standard in the literature, but um, some of the things that I want to highlight in terms of differences require new language. So I'm going to redefine a new terminology as I move along. Um, and so, and then we're going to talk about how What's the connection between the Roy models and the validity of this outcome test? And you know, in turn, what's the connection between this connection and the identification via marginal treatment? So we'll see. So um, as I said, you know, I always list two papers in the first slide that are um, kind of providing the basics of what we're going to talk about uh, today. I listed two. And, you know, I'm going to go back now. It's not because I think that these are the most important papers, not by any means, less so if I'm including one of my papers, but it's just that this is kind of like one of the first fundamental uh, attempts to um, do um, an approach um, test for bias using outcome test. Um, and so it's a classical reference that I want to go over with because it has some elements that are distinct. And then there are papers that did changes, improve upon this one that I'm going to mention along the way, along with papers that highlighted problems with this approach, which also I'm going to mention along the way. And then there came a, a vast literature that I'm not going to go in detail, and which led to the paper that I'm working on, which essentially is trying to clarify some of the issues that are less clear if you go and read the other papers. So 
it's sort of like the beginning and the end. Is that's that's why I have these two papers, okay, as opposed to comprehensive picture. <clears throat> I shouldn't say end, but whatever. Um. Anyway, we're gonna start with the model for racial bias in motor vehicle searches, okay? And that's this paper, um, maybe. Motivation is as follows, okay? We're gonna say there are decision makers and decision makers could be police officers as in our first application, judges as in our second application, could be lenders, journal editors, and you name it. People that at the end of the day is gonna make a decision um, and the decision could be binary or not, but we're gonna be mostly focusing on binary decisions, okay? And then what often happens is that these decision makers um, will lead to disparities in outcomes across affected groups. What are these groups? It could be gender, you know, male, females, could be race, blacks, whites, which we're gonna describe, could be minorities, could be immigrants, non-immigrants, you will do the partition, that is relevant depending on the application. And the question is whether and to what extent this group level difference, disparities are driven by relevant differences in underlying individual characteristics or by biased decision. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about, you know, so called statistical discrimination versus a bias. Okay. And, and, and that will be part of the discussion. So I'm going to start with this first paper, Knowles, Persico, and Todd, 2001, um, JPE. I'm going to refer to this paper as KPT. So here is the application. This is an applied paper. It has an application, and it proposes a model. And from the model, it develops a test. And um, it should be clear that um, um, the, 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 the paper is good given the combination of these three pieces, right? Just having an application in mind, developing the model, and implementing test, which at the end of the day, the test is quite simple. It's, the work is just defined as such a simple test can be assigned a particular interpretation. Hopefully by now, after taking 480 and this part of 481, you will see the pattern that I try to explain all the time, which is uh, oftentimes it doesn't matter how much, uh, so much how you get a number or what number you're getting. It's like the interpretation of what you're obtaining, uh, what matters. Okay. And certain interpretations are sure, everybody will agree. Some other interpretations, people will go like, whoa, 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 whoa. So it's just, I want you to, as you grow up, that you become more and more aware that this is what you should be paying attention. Hopefully that will be the thing that you want to remember. What you want. If you remember something else, that'll be welcome too. So this is the application. Police are gonna check for illegal drugs um, Sorry, police checking for illegal drugs more likely to search vehicles of black motorists than white motorists. Okay, that's sort of like a fact that you can see in the data. And then here I want to call it contraband drugs. It doesn't matter, but the driver is is carrying some illegal activity in the car. Okay, um, again, depending on the application and the setting, you may call that uh, differently. If you're thinking about the border, if you're just thinking about uh, across the city, doesn't really matter. We're going to call them drugs. Okay. Um, KPT is going to develop a model for police and motorist behavior to study bias. This is just going to be important as we move along because we're going to model both sides of the market. Sometimes <clears throat> I'm going to call this one-sided versus two-sided markets, and I'll explain the differences. Or sometimes you may call it like partial equilibrium versus general equilibrium, but um, we're also going to discuss the difference. But importantly, we're going to talk about what the police are doing uh, what's the problem they're solving and what the drivers are doing and what's the problem that they're solving. The idea of the paper is to separate statistical discrimination from prejudice, taste for bias, or just bias. Okay. So KPT is going to take this idea of prejudice or taste for discrimination as a property of the officer's utility function, where statistical discrimination is a property of equilibrium. Okay. So the difference is like, it could be that in equilibrium, say blacks are carrying more drugs than uh, whites, okay? Because that's the optimal solution to the model given the utility functions and so on. And so perhaps as a police officers, you want to take that into account in your search, okay? To be more successful. Um, 
But that is something that, as I said, happens, for example, in equilibrium. Whereas, you know, if in your titular tit function of the police officer, you just simply don't like blacks, that will we'll call that bias, okay? And we're going to talk about it. The insight is that if an officer has the same cost of searching the two subgroups, let's call them blacks and whites, then the returns for searching them will be equal across, um, across the subgroups. So it's the idea here, which goes back to Becker, which, you know, is here down in this line, is that, you know, we're always going to be thinking about um, that in marginal cost equal to marginal benefit. Okay? And in equilibrium, you know, you're just going to search both groups until you set this to the same. And, you know, if you have the same cost for you, it's the same to search a white or a, or a black driver, then these two in equilibrium are going to be the idea for testing for discrimination by looking at differential outcomes, which later are going to be called the outcome test, is original due to Becker. It's just an old idea that it was <coughs> developed in theory. But um, what happens, and what you will see if you get into this literature and start reading papers on discrimination, is that different models and different assumptions and eventually different types of data will lead to different types of outcome tests. So people talk about outcome tests, but at the end of the day, the actual test could be massively different from paper to paper because the only thing that connect these ideas is the fact that you have a model, you model bias in your, uh, you, you, you describe bias in your model, and then you see how that affects certain outcomes and what features you obtain from your model. And that's an outcome test, just comparing outcomes, but comparing outcomes is quite broad. It could mean different things in different settings, and it's actually going to mean different things in different What are the main features of this first model that we're going to describe? Uh, the model belongs to the literature on optimal auditing. Okay, so there are two sides of the market, as I said, the auditor and the auditee. Okay, in this case will be the police officer is the auditor, the driver is the auditee, and we're going to assume that there's a continuum of both. Okay, both parties behave strategically. By that I mean police officers are going to try to think how drivers are behaving. Drivers, in turn, are going to take into account what police officers are doing to make their own decisions, okay? Police officers will optimally decide whether to search for a vehicle or not. They see a vehicle, okay? They have to make a decision whether to search for it or not. And drivers, in turn, will decide whether to carry drugs, contraband, or not, okay? As I said, the connection to Becker is the following. If police are prejudiced, the equilibrium returns to searching members of the group that is discriminated against will be below average, okay? Suppose you have police officers that really dislike one of these groups, say they dislike blacks, so they search black more often. The return for them is just going to be lower because they're just searching, okay, more often when in reality, let's say, uh, it's just that blacks and white carry uh, contraband with the same probability. Um, this idea, okay, that taste for discrimination lead to lower profits for the discriminators is exactly the idea in Becker. Becker was sort of like the first one who um, studied this in the context of firms, okay, and point out that a firm that discriminates against minority employees uses labor inputs less efficiently and so should have lower profits than a non-discriminating firm. And it's just sort of like in a first attempt to start thinking about discrimination from uh, an economic point of view. Um, and so try to put some framework that allows you to think about what are the consequences of one of these decision makers to discriminate or to dislike a given group, okay? What are the consequences in equilibrium? Let's start with the model, okay? So <coughs> the... Um, the driver or the motorist, they have a type. The type is R, B, where R is race, okay? And B are going to be non-race characteristics. Okay, in this literature, typically you describe types with three letters, R, X, and B, where X and B are non-race characteristics of the drivers, and X are things that the econometrician observe, and B are things that the econometrician does not observe. So... I'm not. I'm gonna be ignoring covariance the entire day today because you know you can always condition. You know the, the usual issues of conditioning arise, but they don't add anything conceptually. So let's just stick to this case. It's just adding notation for no purpose. We're gonna have then a type defined by the race, 
and by the non-race characteristics, okay, which in some papers B could be a vector, as in this case it could be, in some other ca cases it will be restricted to be a scalar or a linear index of features, as it will be later. So for simplicity, today we're going to think about B as a scalar, okay? Um, and, and the idea is that the police officer certainly observes B, okay? So, um, um, and then we as econometricians don't know B. So the decision uh, whether to carry contraband drugs or not is the decision that the driver has to take. If they do not carry, we're going to assume that the payoff is zero, whether the car is searched or not. Okay, so if you're just fine, the police stops you, have nothing, you keep going with your life, nothing happens. Okay, now if you carry contraband, there are two payoffs. One is minus, minus lambda S, which is the utility if you are search. And then the other one is lambda N, okay, which is the utility if you're not search. Okay, and we're going to know by gamma RB the pro. <clears throat> the probability that a police officer searches searches a driver of type R and B. So with these objects, you can say, okay, what is the expected payoff of the driver? Well, is the probability that your search times the utility that you get of being searched plus the probability you're not searched times the utility you get of not being searched. And so if you define the problem as like, okay, when is this driver going to carry contraband? whenever this utility is zero, right? Because we normalize the payoff of not carrying to zero. So if the utility expected payoff of carrying drugs is positive, you're going to carry drugs and otherwise you're not going to carry. Okay? This is the problem of the driver. And notice, just to be clear, that the driver is taking one probability here, um, was given, which is this lambda uh, gamma, right? It's a probability that police office searches. This is a panam one of the parameters that is going to be determined in equilibrium. In equilibrium, the police office is going to exercise some effort and, you know, it's going to determine this gamma. The officers. Police officers, um, they don't have a type here, okay? They're just an officer. But later on, there was a paper that is also quite famous by Ambart and Fang, 2006 American Economic Review, who introduced the race of the police officers as part of the analysis. Okay, and so and then you know in that in that paper you you have slightly different results, and they're all you know it's a nice paper, but I cannot present everything today. So I'm gonna stick to this one, which is the first one. Definitely, you need to know this paper if you want to go and read the other one because it builds upon this one. So um, here, the police officers don't have a type, and their decision is whether to search a driver of a type R, B, or not, okay? The goal is to maximize the total number of convictions minus the cost of searching the cars, okay? So going back to Jose's question before, there's a cost. The marginal cost of searching a uh, driver of race R is just going to be determined by this letter tau R, Okay, which is going to be normalized to be between zero and one, given the uh, model that we're using, and then the benefit is going to be normalized to one. Okay, so meaning that the cost that we have here relative to a fraction of the benefit. Okay, so if you hit and you have a benefit of one, uh, the cost is just going to be tau, and then g here is going to be an event. And it's just going to be the event that the motorist is guilty, meaning that you just search. And you found drugs, okay? So what's the police problem? Well, you want to decide the probabilities that you search a given type, okay? By maximizing this function for each race. So you're here doing the blacks and whites separately. And then you're... <coughs> essentially, you have your benefit here, which is the benefit is one times the probability that you are succeed, that the... Uh, uh, driver is guilty minus the cost times the probability that you search that particular type of driver. And here, this is this um, CDF of um, here. Uh, I found a typo. This is R. And, um, 
Um, this should be. I need to change the notation. I. <laughs> all right. So. So this is the density. Of B, given R. Okay, that's what it is. Use that notation. Okay, is the density of the distribution of B conditional on rates. Okay, so this is what the police officer is solving. So how do we define discrimination in this model? We're gonna say case for discrimination or racial bias or prejudice. Let's say a police officer is racially prejudiced or has what is called taste for discrimination, which is a terminology introduced again by Becker, if the cost of searching whites and blacks is different. Okay, if the if the police officer feels that the cost of searching one group over the other one is different, um, then you will call them uh, bias. Okay, and this is part, as we said, of their utility function over here. Okay, and not part of the solution of this problem. Whereas we're going to define statistical discrimination if in the case where this cost is the same across race, okay, we have that um, an outcome exhibits statistical discrimination if gamma B is different than gamma uh, white, where these gammas are just integrators and in integrated versions of uh, the probability that you search a given race, I mean, a given type RB, which just integrates over the known race characteristics. You have a marginal probability of searching a white, a marginal probability of searching a uh, black. And if these probabilities are different in equilibrium, then there's statistical discrimination. Okay. So I wrote here, tau is part of the preferences, whereas gamma is an equilibrium object. Okay. So in the definition of statistical discrimination, we could have used different notions. Okay. For example, gamma BB, is different than gamma WB for some B or things like that. Um, so none of these definitions sometimes are like clear. This is the one, the only one that you can make. Sometimes you can define things slightly different. In this paper, they just go for this one. If this is different for all B, of course, this is just going to be different as well. Um, but I'm just saying um, one thing that I would point out if you just get involved in this literature and you want to reading papers is you know be careful not to just take the definitions that are given to you as like you know okay this is what it is always devote some time trying to think does this make sense is there an alternative way of thinking because most often there are and if one issue with this literature despite having a lot of papers that are actually really good is that there are, um for my taste too many implicit assumptions too many assumptions that are when i say implicit is that it's just implicit in the notation is not discussed anywhere in the paper. And then when you start thinking about what are the properties of where you're deriving, they completely depend on that assumption that is not even discussed in the paper. Okay, and I wanna point to one here, paper, and then I wanna point to others in the, the, the presentation. All right, so with this application and following this paper, we're gonna uh, derive something that I call average base outcome test. Again, this is something I call. I'm seeing trying to persuade my co-authors that we should use this terminology moving forward. They're not even familiar with it. But um and the reason is you want to be clear. <coughs> and the reason why I like to use this terminology, average base outcome test versus marginal base outcome test, is that this paper, um, all the papers just go back to Becker discrimination is always about a person at the margin. Like you're going to be searching at some point you're going to, as I said, you're going to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. They're going to be a marginal person you're going to search. Okay. And discrimination is always about that marginal person. It's like, if you think about in economics, all the statements that we make are always about the margin It's about for the first order of conditional holding. And, you know, these papers are going to notice that unless you observe everything in this case, for example, B, uh, you're never going to be able to say who is the marginal person. You don't even have data on margins. You just have aggregated data. 
And so the question is, how can you talk about discrimination, which is a statement about the margin, using aggregated data or averages? And the answer is going to be, we're going to write down a model where the average equals the marginal behavior, where the marginal behavior aggregates to the same average behavior. And so it's going to lead to tests that are outcome tests that are using averages, even though the actual requirement is on the margin. Let's go over that. Equilibrium. In equilibrium, drivers will randomize the decision to carry contraband, and officers will randomize the decision to search. Okay. In other words, the problem that this utility in the driver of carrying contraband has to be exactly equal to zero. And if you set it exactly equal to zero, you're going to have this <clears throat> solution over here, which is the driver is going to randomize whenever the probability of being searched is equal to this gamma star over here. Otherwise, you, you won't have an equilibrium because, you know, for example, the driver, uh, if gamma is lower than this, these type of drivers will always carry contraband, okay? Because, you know, that's uh, the utility is higher. And then police officers will know that these people are always carrying contraband, so they will have to search more. And if they search more, then, you know, this gamma will go up. So as you see, like in equilibrium, uh, police officers will search with this probability. The drivers are going to be indifferent and are going to be carrying um, contraband. Um, and so... Um, it also has to happen that the police officer will need to randomize, okay? And so in that case, it follows that the probability of succeeding, meaning of finding a vehicle that is guilty, conditional on the type, has to be equal to the cost of searching that vehicle. And this needs to happen for all races and Bs, okay? And what this is saying is that in equilibrium, okay, this probability of finding guilty is just going to be flat. This probability of finding guilty as a function of the non-race characteristics is um, going to be flat. And so I wrote here, in equilibrium, motorists respond to officers, and so they carry drugs with probability equal to tau r. Then you have these two forces going on. Drivers randomize, randomize, police officers randomize. You have an equilibrium, and you are good to go. So what are the implications now? Well, remember our definition of bias or not being biased. It meant that the cost of searching whites and blacks were the same. Let's call it tau bar here. So the equilibrium condition says that the probability that you find somebody guilty that is a black driver with characteristics B has to be the same as the probability you find somebody guilty if it's a white driver with characteristics B. All right? And so this is going to be something that will happen in equilibrium, you, you're equally successful for blacks and whites in equilibrium if you are not racially biased, okay? You may be searching more blacks than whites, but you're equally successful in your success rate, okay, across genders. And I said, this doesn't mean that the gammas are going to be the same. The gammas could be different. Okay, why? Because it could be, for example, that the value of, you know, not being searched for blacks is higher than the value or utility of not being searched uh, for whites. And so this is totally allowed for in this model, and this will be an indication of statistical discrimination. In other words, if you just look at, at, at the success rate, then you can just see that in equilibrium, this should be the same. You should look at the search rate. Well, the search rate could be different, could be signs of statistical discrimination. And this actually leads to the so-called outcome test that is proposed in this paper, which um, has the following intuition. If officers are profiling black drivers due to racial prejudice, they will search blacks even, uh, even when the return from searching them, the probability of successful searches against blacks are smaller than those from searching whites. Okay. So I wrote more precisely, if racial prejudice is the reason for racial profiling, then the success rate against the marginal black motorist, okay, will be lower than the success rate for the marginal white motorist. The difficulty is that researcher never observes their search uh, success rate against the marginal driver, okay? And this is known and, as the inframarginality problem. The inframarginality problem, in discussing this literature extensively, and it's always about different flavors of how you can go from marginals to averages or how averages will in general be different than marginal 
behavior. However, in this model, the success rate of the marginal moderates equal the success rate of the average moderates, and this allows a version of the outcome test based on averages, which is what I'm calling average-based outcome test. The test that wants to say something about the margin, but does so by using averages. And the formal argument is here, okay? Consider the equation that we had before, the equilibrium equation, and then consider the case where the cost of searching black and white is the same, okay? We don't have data on B, of course, and we won't have, say, perhaps even data on gamma. But what we can do, and this is what this line says, it is sufficient to have data on the frequency of guilt by race conditional on being searched. But well, this is the data that is easily available. What is that? Let's define Q of W, Y, the probability of success conditional on being searched. So is this integral over the distribution of B of the probability of success is weighted by the fact that you conditional on being searched. In equilibrium, this P star equals tau bar. So I pull it out of the expectation. And I wrote here, one key requirement for this operation is this idea that tau does not depend on B. Because if tau depends on B, I cannot take it out of the integral. And this is one of these implicit assumptions that are there. When you define the model, you didn't ever talk about why searching, you know, um, somebody from different races could be different, but you cannot uh, allow tau to differ in other Bs. In other words, what this model is saying is that the only form of bias possible in this setting is racial, not discriminate on any other characteristic. Anyway, let's take that assumption as given. So now look at this integral. This integral, which is one, so you get tau bar. And then you do the same if you just do exactly the same manipulation, but with the blacks here, which is QB. So in this model, if there's no taste for discrimination, the frequency of guilt of whites conditional on being searched is equal to the frequency of guilt for blacks conditional on being searched. And so you can include no bias if these two are the same. In terms of mechanics, you can, of course, look at averages. But this is like if you want to think in terms of regression, you can just run a regression of frequency of guilt on race, you know, least squares done averages. But this is the outcome test. So, you know, to the credit of this paper, now um, as a paper that gives you a model, um, it tells you what's the definition of bias in the model and using the structure of the model delivers an implication that you can test with data. And the requirements on the data that you need to check this are very minimal which is, which is a, a plus of this paper in the sense that, you, look, you just only need the frequency of guilt by race condition on being searched, which is data that is widely available, is the data they use in the application, okay? They, they have this data. Whereas, like, if you want to do something more sophisticated, you will need to have more information, which sometimes is not available. Of course, all the implications and the solutions will depend on the validity of the model, as usual. KPT finds evidence that these two things are the same. That is, they find evidence that there is no racial bias, okay? But they also find evidence that blacks are searched more often than whites, okay? So in other words, this paper concludes in a way that there's a statistical discrimination, but that there's no racial bias in this context, okay? When you look at the mechanics of this model, a key feature, okay, that is discussed in the paper uh, at length is that the drivers respond to what the police officers are doing. This is one of the main pieces that give you identification in this case. With such little data, I say, what, what, where's the identification coming from? It's coming from this response. As I wrote here, if moderates did not react to the probability of being searched, testing for prejudice would require data on B. This is something that is going to be a common factor moving forward that in order to have good tests of discrimination, you will need to observe this, you have the same information set than the decision makers, in this case, the officers. And that is actually most often really difficult. Um, and as I said before, the fundamental assumption in this paper, which is hidden, is that this function tau 
does not depend on B. That is, it's not tau R B. So there's no difference between the marginal and the average search success rate. This is what, what this assumption is buying. At the same time, it means that you cannot discriminate on other factors. Like in the example you had in mind before about the location of the driver, you have, you're in a certain neighbor or whatever, um, that, that you cannot allow for that in this model. Also, as I said, there are a number of papers that have improved, extend the results from this one. One notable one is the one by Anwar and Peng. Okay. Um, they improve in dimensions, but these papers also implicitly maintain and assume this condition over here. So you'll see a big deal about how we can allow for this, we can allow for that, we have better power, we have a different outcome test. It's just go and read this paper by Anwar and Peng. The mechanics of the outcome test are different. They, it doesn't um, involve comparing this like QW and QB that I said before. Just they, they develop a, a different implication because they consider a different model where now you introduce, for example, the race of the police officer in the equation. But as I said, this assumption is implicit there and it's not even discussed. So um, something to have in mind. Then several years later, there's this paper by Brock, Cooley, Dulov, and Navarro, okay, in Journal of Econometrics that shows that average phase outcome tests are not robust to letting tau depend on. And the paper is more general and have a, a different discussion. But the main important feature is that this is provided the distribution of this B condition on race is different. That is, if the distribution of B conditional race was the same, then you could allow these models to have this additional feature and everything will go through. And you can see that in our derivation over here, because if tau was inside here, okay, and I can change this for this, okay, then you can see that you can do manipulations that will go through here. So the, the main point of this paper was a paper criticizing a lot of the literature before, and in particular, criticizing this paper and the one that we're seeing over here is that, um, you know, these papers are correct, but you cannot extend them to account for an observed heterogeneity when, when this is going on, which you would imagine that you would expect perhaps that these two distributions will be different, but if they happen to be the same, then they clarify that things will go through. All right, questions about this? All right, so I wanted to start with that paper, okay, because as I said, it's a key reference in this literature, and it shows you how things sort of like started early on. It shows this situation in which you consider a situation where both sides are behaving strategically, and uh, shows you how you can go to a very simple outcome test uh, that, you know, had issues, uh, and, but in a way, it formalized this idea that you, you can say things about the margin by just looking at averages. As I said, there's a lot of years in the literature, like, you know, 15 years or so in the middle, and then we're gonna get to a number of papers that are gonna be able to talk about margins. How are they gonna talk about margins? Well, you know this already. They're gonna be using things like marginal treatment effects, right? Which marginal treatment effects we learn gives information about an individual at the margin. And the margin is observed by something that is it's defined with something that is unobserved, right? The use that we had before and so on. So looks at that framework will give us uh, things, but we're not gonna get there yet. We're gonna just talk about Roy models. And then we, we know what Roy models are. So um, let's just, um, go over that and see how that fits into this idea of modeling um, discrimination. So, overview, sort of like recap, Becker had this idea on how to test for bias. And if you think conceptually about what this idea is, it has three steps or stages. First, you define a model, and in the context of your model, you can determine what when decisions are you know, non-discriminatory or unbiased. You can should be able to tell me in your model, what does it mean for an agent or a decision maker to be uh, biased or not? Then you're gonna derive optimality conditions, okay? 
because the agents are optimizing something, maximizing profits, maximizing utility, trying to maximize success rate. They're doing something or minimizing some costs. And so you're going to just define optimal behavior. And then once you have these optimality conditions, these optimality conditions will have some implications on certain outcomes. And you're going to try to exploit those implications to check if they're consistent with behavior. Okay. So in a way, you have a model where unbiased decision makers will lead to certain implications. So then you can go and test in your data what those implications are. That's the idea in there. And this inspired the literature on discrimination to analyze group level disparities. Okay. As I said, early on, it was about this average behavior. Okay. But, you know, the challenges are that you had in those cases were selection bias and inframarginality. We didn't talk about selection bias, but you could imagine that certain police officers specialize more in certain areas or whatever. And suppose that you send your toughest officers to the poor neighborhoods and or the neighborhoods that are, you know, say there are more individuals of a certain race, and then you have nicer offices in some other neighborhood, and then you start seeing these disparities. Okay, and a lot had to do with which offices were where. So there's heterogeneity in the offices, which didn't happen in the first. And then the inframarginality we talk about. Okay, so here you have, you know, these papers that I mentioned before as places to start uh, reading and, and thinking about where the literature was at the time. More recently, random assignment of decision makers opened new doors to let comparisons of marginal behavior across groups. And this is related to what Philippe said before, like what if you just randomize police officers or things like that? Well, if you randomize this is Jamaica, you definitely kill selection bias. And depending on how you model things, you can just stop talking about averages and just directly say something about the marginal individual. And so the problem with this literature is that it also claims greater levels of generality in the scope of the decision model. Like, you know, the model allows for all these features that look really nice and it's uh, kind of unclear whether that is true or not. And then uh, there's uh, a number of papers by Adobe and co-authors. Okay, I'm listing a few here. And, you know, one of the first ones of this is the 2018 QJ paper. And so what we're going to do now is try to put all this together, think about how we can formalize all these ideas and, you know, um, see if it is true that you can have these levels of generality in this, uh, <clears throat> in this type of uh, more recent literature on this. So here's where we come in. Um, this, um, this paper that I wrote with, that I'm working on with Magnum Oxton and Jack Mountjoy. And the idea is that we say recent methods exploiting marginal based outcome tests share distinctive features. Okay. First, there are one sided markets. So the main application is going to be bail decisions in the criminal justice. I want to describe that in detail in the next slide. So for now, bear with me. But the idea is that there's going to be a judge that is going to decide whether to release a defendant or not. The defendant, the decision of the defendant doesn't affect the model because the defendant is there doesn't take into account what the judge does. So in that sense, it's going to be one-sided. Um, the decision model is going to belong to the class of what we're going to call generalized Roy models. It's a cost benefit analysis, the same type of benefit analysis that we defined before, where D is the utility of zero and the utility of choosing one and which one is greater than what you pick. Okay. And these papers have um, two institutional settings that they exploit that allows them to bypass these two problems, the inframarginality and the selection bias. The first one is that they have random assignment of judges and that avoids selection bias. It turns out that the bail setting in the US is such that, you know, just judges get randomly assigned to cases as they appear. Okay. Uh, these decisions need to be made uh, sort of like quickly. It's not like is this is a trial is where perhaps judges are specialized, right? But in bail, it's just, you know, you get whatever you get on a given day. And so these are randomly assigned. So you don't have selection bias. You don't have bail judges that specialize in black defendants or uh, a particular type of defendants. And then the other thing is that they're going to have or leverage here near continuous variation in the judges to isolate marginal defendants. You grab places like in Philadelphia and so on. Uh, I, I forgot actually the actual places, but you know, um, there are going to be cities in the U.S. or districts where you have a lot of judges. Okay. 
And so when you have a large number of judges, if you just think about judges uh, as, as the thing that is going to give us variation, then uh, we're going to see that having a continuum of judges in the extreme is going to allow us to identify the marginal defendant. Okay? And so we're going to be able to implement a test that is just going to hold for the marginal defendant and not for the average in any way. And so this will allow us to compare outcome probabilities for marginal blacks and marginal white defendants using what I'm calling here marginal based outcome test. What is that? I want to refer to our paper as CMM. CMM examines the identifying power of marginal based outcome tests in Roy models. They provide results on when and why we can learn about racial bias uh, through this marginal based outcome test. Hope that it provides a blueprint for the researchers who consider using this test to detect bias in different settings. And for concreteness, we're going to focus on the pre tire release framework uh, of this paper by ADY. So the results um, apply more generally, and we're still debating how we're going to write the paper for more clarity. But for now, I'm going to stick to that. So before we move forward, let's see, uh, hopefully, if you're clear about how this bail setting works. There's a defendant. Here's your defendant. It has a race, is white or black, and it has non-race characteristics B. Okay, same as before. This defendant is uh, it's a suspect of a crime. It's assigned randomly to a judge. Then I'm going to denote by Z. Okay, this is going to be our judge. Judge is going to make a decision D, and in particular D1 is going to be releasing the defendant. Okay. Now, if the defendant is released. There's going to be a pre-trial period, a number of time until you get to the trial. And during that period, this defendant may incur in misconduct, may commit another crime, okay? And so we're going to call that pre-trial misconduct or misconduct, okay? And then we're going to use potential outcomes as usual. Notice here I'm going to use Y1 and Y0 as before, but in this setting, we're going to use the fact, which is a simplification, that y0 is just zero. That is, if you're detained, you cannot commit another crime. Okay? So um, that's what we're going to do. And what are the marginal based outcome tests? It's going to conclude that there is racial bias if the probability that the, uh, the probability of committing pretrial misconduct of the marginal white depend the marginal white is higher than the probability of pretrial misconduct of the marginal black. So the idea is that when you see the 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 misconduct rates of release defendants, and you happen to see that white, okay, or the marginal white in this case, is 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 much more likely to commit or to misbehave than the marginal black. Then you know you're gonna say, well, this happens because the judge, okay, is being more lenient with whites, and so it's releasing whites that are more um, uh, that are riskier at the at the margin, okay. Uh, or it's being tougher with the blacks, you know, it's the other way. And so it's just really releasing, um, you know, safer defendants at the margin. This is the idea of the marginal base outcome test. I'm going to describe it formally, but I just wanted to tell you what the idea was here um, in the setting. So what are the results that we're going to see now? Well, in this paper, we studied the suitability of the generalized Roy model and the so-called extended Roy model. So I'm going to present both. Okay. And then we're going to show that marginal outcome tests are logically invalid in the context of this so-called generalized Roy model. It means that an analyst may find bias when judges are racially unbiased. The analyst may conclude no bias when the judges are racially biased. And the problem of this is that Essentially, unbiased judges do not necessarily equalize outcome probabilities of the marginal white and marginal black defendants in this model. Show this. This matters because this generalized Roy model is the one that has been claimed in the literature to be flexible and nice to study bias. Okay? What we show as well is that these marginal based outcome tests are work like a charm in the context of the extended Roy model. But the extended Roy model has a restriction. What is that restriction? Well, the restriction is that the only source of bias is racial, which takes us away to a condition like the one we saw in KPT, okay, that tau not depending on B. Um, so um, you're going to see it clearly because on purpose, I decided to use notation 
from this paper so that the connection is transparent. Just go and read the paper by KPT. It's hard to see because the notation doesn't even help and it's difficult to make the connection perhaps. But here it's just going to be transparent, hopefully. So once we clarify this distinction between the generalized and the extended Roy model, we're going to study identification and we're going to show that the generalized Roy model does not admit a marginal treatment effect representation without further assumptions. Again, for people like you that are experts now on marginal treatment effects and Roy models, then this is just going to be trivial. But people end up forgetting these details as they move forward. And then you, more, at least some of you, you know, in 10 years, you're a, a successful applied microeconomist, you will forget the things as well because that's what people do. So hopefully you will try to not belong to that type and remember this thing. So we're going to talk about it. The standard Roy model at the same time, automatically delivers a valid MT representation. So the extended Roy model gives you all that you need. It's valid, it's logical, and it gives you identification. However, it suffers from a serious restriction that in many cases is going to be hard to digest. And this is the trade-off that you have studying discrimination. People dislike oftentimes when we present results like this, okay? I've written many papers where I show that things are not pink, okay? But uh, people don't like to hear that either you assume a model that is restrictive and then you can interpret things as you want, or you assume a model that is general, but then nothing works. Yeah, all right. So let's set up the model. Um, the variables are going to be the judges, C, the defendants, type RB, decision D, outcome Y. There's going to be an incarceration cost that I'm going to call C of the given by the judge, okay? So, and then there's going to be a judge information set that I want to denote by W of Z. And what is the judge information set? It's going to include race. It's going to include non-race characteristics. It's going to include X's that are non-race characteristics that are also observed by the econometrician. I want to ignore them from now on for simplicity, but they are there. And then there's going to include some beliefs, okay? Um, again, this may not be the best way to describe this, but that's the one that I'm playing with right now to see if it works. And there's going to be belief on the, you know, conditional distributions of outcomes, conditional race and B, or joint distributions of B and R. Okay, so, and you're going to see in a minute why I want to introduce these beliefs, uh, but um, they're going to be there. And then we're going to introduce the taste for discrimination parameter. That here I'm going to call beta ZRB, okay, is the taste that Judge C has on a defendant. Of, of type R and B. So what's the decision problem? The, all the discussion for now is just going to be for an individual judge. Okay, forget that the fact that there are many. We're going to see what that gives us later. It's going to give us identification of marginal treatment effects, for example. But for now, just think about one judge. Here, I just call it Z prime to make it explicit that I'm just talking about a specific judge. Later on, I'm just going to call it Z. Uh, but stay with me. So judge Z prime minimizes expected cost, where expected here means that the expectation condition on the information set. So the judge decides whether to release or not by minimizing the expected cost. What is the expected cost? Well, you pay the cost C if you detain, right? That's the cost, incarceration cost. And you uh, have the cost YD, which is going to be one, okay, uh, if, if you um, release. Okay, remember that y0 is just zero. So this term doesn't appear when d is zero, but when d is uh, one, okay, you're going to have uh, y1 here. And then you're, you know, you're multiplying the cost of releasing by your taste, okay? So it's like for you, the fact that somebody incurs misconduct is different whether that person, you know, is of different race or potentially different b, okay, rb here. All right. Um, this may look strange to you. Part of the reason is because I'm, as I said, I'm keeping a gazillion papers in the middle. But if you just look at, for example, the paper by Persico in 2009, that paper that I listed over there, which is a nice survey paper, you'll see that in that paper, Persico just introduces this beta, okay, as a taste for discrimination and shows how like a bunch of different models, including the one that we just see, can be interpreted as like, you know, multiplying or adding a beta in the utility function. So this belongs to the family of models that people have been using 
with the exception here that typically that beta only depends on race. Here we're allowing this beta to depend on the judge, race, and D. Okay. What is the generalized Roy model? Well, the judge optimization problem leads to an optimal decision D. And the optimal decision is release if the cost of releasing, sorry, release if the cost of releasing, yes, is does not exceed the cost of detaining. Okay. And the cost of releasing is beta times the probability or the expectation. Remember that Y1 is binary. So this could be the probability of misconduct condition on your information set. Know here that the expected value of Y1 condition information set of the judge may not equal the probability that a defendant incurs in misconduct given the race and B, which is their type. Okay. If judge miscalculates, this is typo. If judge miscalculates. So we're allowing now one to model this situation in which the judge needs to assess how risky this person is and may make mistakes. Okay. And so one way to formalize this that is simple and will allow us to have a clean interpretation is to simply say that the expected value given the information set is just some function lambda times the true probability. Okay. This is the true probability. Like if you have data on, you know, crime upon release, given race and other things, that will be the data, what the data identifies, right? But um, judges, in principle, could, you could just write a model where judges use that. But here we just want to allow the possibility that judges make mistakes. But we're going to allow for that later. Right now, assume that lambda equals 1. What is lambda equals 1? Lambda equals 1 gives us that uh, this, these two um, expectations are the same. And so, as I said, I want to come back to this later, but assume this for now. And so what is the definition of the generalized Roy model is this. The decision is you release the candidate whenever the cost of releasing is less than or equal than the cost of detaining. And what I did was take this beta to the other side, and I defined this function tau. Okay. Tau is just going to be related to the KPT that we had before, related to the function tau in some of these papers that I mentioned before. But um, we are being explicit here about how you can make a connection between what I'm calling the taste of discrimination and this threshold tau over here. This is the generalized Roy model. What are the features? of the generalized Roy model. Well, on the right, you have the expected cost. Less, you have the expected benefit of release, or you can say the expected cost of detaining. There are five features that are important, so I'm going to go over them one by one. The first one is the cost of release is tied to an observed outcome, okay? Given that our assumptions that the judges don't make mistakes, then the expected value of Y1 given R and B is just the probability of misconduct conditional on the Type of the defendant. So, and the probability of misconduct is something that we we observe. Second, the benefit of release, this function tau, that that's why I gather all the things that come from the model into this tau is unobserved. Okay, and it's actually going to be the object of interest because tau captures behavior, captures whether judges are racially biased or not. Know that both the race and B enter the cost function and the benefit function. Here we have both of them. Here we have both of them. This is a feature, main characteristic feature of this generalized Roy model. Judges observe R and B, but the analyst observes only race. Here we're again back to the same situation we described in the paper by KPT. We assume that as a researcher, we don't observe B because otherwise it, the problem becomes really um, simple. And then B here is really required to be a scalar, given that we're going to use all this Roy model machinery. Okay. And so typically in the literature, it's called signal of risk. And it was, you know, there's a nice discussion in this paper by Anwar and Fang that I said before. So if you imagine all this stuff that the judge observes uh, are going to be some uh, a vector typically of unobservables, 
And so you can imagine that, you know, if those vectors of Van Osterwald is U, B is just a linear index of that. And so, as I said, there's a nice discussion in that paper because um, you can imagine, in that paper is also about police search, right? But suppose you coming back to the judges that these defendants, you know, you can see their demeanor, the way they talk, if they have tattoos or not, and the body size, and the, you know, uh, <coughs> the tone of their skin, color, and so on. There are all these dimensions. And it's hard to think that the judges are, you know, thinking or mapping R10 into, you know, some function. You would imagine that the judge will just collapse all that information to some, you know, signal of risk, some some index that tells you, like, you know, if this guy looks fine or if it doesn't, okay, how, how does it look? And so this is what this model is capturing. Judges collect all these dimensions into a scalar that we call a B, and it's a signal of risk. And so now that I call it signal of risk, since we can always relabel, then high values of B, okay, are going to be like, you know, bad because it's risky. Low values of B are going to be good because it looks like the person is uh, risky. All right. These are the five distinctive features of this model that hopefully are more or less clear. Now let's talk about the extended Roy model. What is an extended Roy model? Well, we saw this already implicitly. We said a common restriction in this literature that I said in early on, at least, was not even discussed, is that this taste for discrimination is such that it doesn't depend on B, okay? Just depends on race. We can let it depend on the judge here, but it doesn't depend on race. This is commonly used in these papers and others, okay? The implication, as I said before, is that no form of bias other than racial. And in our setting with marginal based outcome tests, this restriction translates to the function tau not depending on B. And if you impose that restriction, you get to the so called extended Roy model. So we just put it here, it's exactly the same model as before, except that there's no B here. No B on the right-hand side. This, the implications of this are huge. See them, okay? They connect to things that you've been exposed already as well. Then when I talk about the generalized Roy model, I mean just this tau function can depend on B, which is the same as the beta function can depend on B. When I talk about the extended Roy model, this tau function cannot depend on B. So discussion. And think about taste for discrimination. Um, models share the same, I didn't define legitimate optimization problem here, but meaning like the, the judges are just trying to uh, broadly define or minimize costs of really, okay. But uh, they differ in the taste for discrimination parameter beta. One depends on B, the other one doesn't. What does it mean? In the extended Roy model, all bias in the decision-making man manifests itself into one form, racial bias. That's the only thing that it is allowed. Whereas in the generalized Roy model, bias can vary in magnitude with other characteristics, okay? So not only you can, you know, be biased uh, uh, according to other characteristics, but also, you know, you don't have to be equally biased against all blacks. Say, if you're biased against blacks, you can be more biased against certain types of blacks than other types of blacks. And I wrote here speech pattern, body weight, facial gestures, and features, and so on. So arguably, the generalized Roy model, there's a reason why the word generalized is there, uh, is more general than the extended Roy model. It allows for a richer such set of behavior. Then you can think what happens with measurement error, prediction error, like these judges may make mistakes. So that is captured with our notation before with that lambda not being equal to one. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, tau, what I defined before was c divided by beta. Well, now just take that lambda to the side. Tau would be c divided by beta times lambda, because as I wrote here, tau is a catch-all for residual factors beyond the probability of misconduct. So any error in the generalized Roy model on this expectation, the judges are making mistakes, and let's say that they make uh, more mistakes for certain type of individuals than others, so their error depends on r and b, they can be absorbed by the function tau, nothing changes. The generalized Roy model allows for any type of measurement error and prediction error. Just put it on the other side. 
and then you're just going to be capturing the function tau. Of course, you're going to be mixing, you know, taste for discrimination with errors. And then the question that you should ask yourself if that's the case, and if you care about that is, you know, how do you want to interpret a judge that is more likely to make mistakes for say blacks of a certain type than for whites of a certain type. And if you, know, you call that discrimination, would you call that, that perhaps they're harder to measure? I don't know. But what's true is that in the generalized Roy model, uh, nothing changes in the model as this function tau absorbs everything. Whereas in the extended Roy model, you know, you have that this function over here, since again, we have this structure where lambda will be at the bottom, must not depend on B to be consistent with the model. So, or, so in other words, you can say that measurement error must be uncorrelated with B. You don't allow to have um, differential mistakes for different values of B. Okay, and the final point that I'm gonna point out, which is, I'm not gonna put a lot of weight here, is that in a minute, we're gonna show that the marginal-based outcome test may fail in the context of the generalized Roy model. But as I said earlier, there was this paper by Brock et al. who showed that the average base outcome test exhibit problems when these conditional distributions are different. Whereas here in the context of marginal base outcome tests, the results do not depend on whether this is different or not. The arguments are totally different, okay? So even if they are the same, you're still gonna have problems. So. Um, if you want to tell a story in, in the first paper by Brock at all, if you wanted, you know, if you weren't one of the authors of the first few papers, you could say, okay, look, I can claim that these two distributions are roughly the same in my setting. So I'm not subject to your criticism. Fine. But in our case, our results do not depend on anything like that. So uh, you can't use arguments like that to get away from the criticism. So let's define a few things and then let's talk about the results. How are we going to define racial bias? This was the question I got earlier, so now here's the answer. We're going to say judge C is racially unbiased if the taste for discrimination does not depend on race, okay, for all values of B. And we say that judge C is partially racially biased against a black defendant if beta is less than or equal if beta y is less than or equal than beta b for all b with a strict inequality for some interval. Right? So you're less than or equal and you're strict inequality for some values of b. And we say that judge c is completely racially biased, okay? If this is strict inequality for all b. What's important is two things. The first one is that this definition are, applies for the same value of b. So b, 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 b. Okay, so comparisons given uh, same level of non-race characteristics. And the other thing is that the, in the extended Roy model, B is not there because as I said, we don't allow this to be B. So there's no distinction between partially and complete, completely biased. Okay, they're the same because you just have this inequality, bias. So in the extended Roy model, this definition are a lot easier. Okay, and in the generalized Roy model, that are more delicate because you have the B going on. Okay. Realize that maybe going too many slides without a question slide. Do you have questions? Okay. Now we can define the marginal defendant. So far we haven't done it, okay? But now we can do it. And we're gonna do this using this single crossing condition, which is one of uh, the assumptions that we have. I think it's intuitive, it says for all judges and R, there exists a marginal defendant we're gonna call B star ZR, okay? In the interior of its support, such that the probability of misconduct for that individual of race R, okay, is equal to the cost of incarceration, okay? And then we're gonna assume that it is single crossing. So for any B below that marginal one, you have this inequality. For any B above that um, marginal one, you have an inequality. So again, I want you to think about signals of risk because I think it helps. 
So you just are a judge. And then you just look at B for a given race, okay? Conditional whites, just look at whites, just look at B, and then you say, okay, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. It's like, oh, this guy is too risky. This is, okay, this makes me indifferent. That's the marginal price. And it's determined in terms of the signal of risk, okay? And then you do the same with blacks. Nothing here in this definition tells you that the marginal white and the marginal black are going to be the same by any means, okay? It's just an equality between benefits, cost, and benefit, okay? The individual and the marginal. The individual that makes the judge indifferent. Now, the same single crossing condition holds for the Roy model, the extended Roy model, okay? It's just that here it doesn't depend on B, but but the, the B is the B star is defined in exactly the same way by setting these two the same. So the marginal base outcome test, which is what I describe in words right now, it's just this. Effective value of Y1 condition on, on white and the marginal B is greater than the effective value of Y condition on blacks and the marginal B. This is bias. And if these two are the same, no bias. That's what the outcome test is doing. And then I know that now the notation looks different, but you know, if you compare it to stuff that we've done before, you know, you have the expected value of Y1, you know, given race. And instead of using B, let me use U. And then instead of using, uh, let me just use something like U, U star. And then you start thinking, seeing how this starts looking a lot like an MTE type of thing. Okay. Um, because remember that you can also write this, just in case not clear, as Y1 minus Y0. Right. Because we said that in this setting, y0 is exactly equal to zero. So now it starts looking more and more like uh, E, where you're conditioning on some unobserved heterogeneity, which in this case is the signal of risk at some particular point. I'll get into this later, but just as a form of <clears throat> preview. All right. So apologies that today I'm, I know. I'm aware that I'm going perhaps faster than usual, uh, but the presentation today is longer than usual, as you see. So, um, but I, I want to cover all this stuff. So again, I'm not expecting you to follow everything that I'm saying perfectly, maybe too fast, maybe too much, uh, but I want to get it done. So let's talk about marginal outcome tests via marginal treatment effects and the main results that we have. So first, you know, I said the outcome tests are logically invalid. What does he mean? Well, first, let me define what a logically valid test is. We're going to say that the outcome test is logically valid if and only if these two outcomes at the margin are equal whenever the judge is racially unbiased. And this inequality happens whenever the judge is partially or racially biased against black defendants. So I told you how people use this test. People just, you know, just say, oh, if these two are in equality, then there's racial bias. If these two are the same, there are no bias. That's how this is used in practice. So, so our definition is saying like, okay, if you use it like this in practice, it has to be that when this is the same, this is racially unbiased. And when this happens, the judge is biased against black defendants. Could be partially, could be completely. I don't care, but it's biased, okay? And we view this as a minimal requirement for this to make sense, okay? So implication is that marginal white and black defendants should have the same probability of pretrial misconduct if and only if their common judge is racially unbiased. Okay. All right. So I need two assumptions and I'm ready to present the main result. The two assumptions are regularity conditions. They are not important because, you know, in the paper, we just prove everything with local versions of this. But uh, let me present this. First is C, uh, the assumption of the expected cost. The expected cost function, which is this probability of pretrial misconduct, is continuous and non-decreasing in B. Okay? So as I said, if you interpret this as a signal of risk, okay, and then here you put this probability, and here you put B, then you're saying that this is continuous and goes up. The riskier the candidate, that actually translates into a higher probability of pretrial misconduct. Okay? Again, and then the expected cost is continuous and is strictly decreasing in B. Okay, so the benefits of releasing a candidate are going to be de decaying in B because it's a signal of risk. If B is small, then the benefits are high. 
fee is really big, then this is a very risky individual and the benefits are really low. So as I wrote here, the main result that I'm going to present in the next slide holds on the local versions of these conditions. So these functions could be discontinuous, could be non-monotonic. The only thing is you need certain area in which these things happen. But it's easier to think about this model in the continuous case because you have a nice kind of like a supply and demand thing uh, with a crossing. Okay. Actually, in the paper or when I present this paper, I include some pictures that illustrate this uh, sort of like a graphical illustration on the of the main theorem. But I'm not going to do that today, so that I can keep moving. Okay. This is the first main result. I'm going to read it. Let assumptions single crossing continuity on the cost function continuity on the benefit function hold. And consider a generalized Roy model. This is important. We're talking about the generalized Roy model. And a judge C prime. Okay. First part. Suppose a judge C prime is racially unbiased. Okay. And that means this inequality that we defined before. The marginal white may exhibit a higher misconduct probability than the marginal black. Here you go. So what is this saying? It says, oh, you have a model where judges are completely unbiased. They don't take race into their utility function. Yet. You have that the marginal white has a higher misconduct probability than the marginal black. And this is something that uh, when I present to the test, you would conclude that there's bias. You would conclude that judges are biased here, right? Well, this is saying in the context of this model, you can have judges that are unbiased, and yet this is going to happen. Suppose now that judge C is partially biased against black defendants. Then that means that this inequality holds, and then it holds with strict equality for some b. This is how we describe it. Then the marginal black may exhibit identical misconduct probability than the marginal white. So you have this, or it may also be that you have an inequality in the opposite direction. So look what this is saying. You can have a model in which judge is partially biased against a black defendant, yet your outcome test tells you that there's discrimination against whites or that there is no discrimination whatsoever. Worse yet, this result in two holds if Z is completely biased against black defendants. If this inequality holds strictly for all values of B, okay, then you can still happen that this and this happens. This is the first main result. So what's the problem? The problem is that judges equalize outcome probabilities for the same value of B. If you look at the model that we wrote, it's all for the same value of B. I highlighted how the same value of B appears everywhere. Yet, most often, the marginal white and the marginal black defendants are not going to have the same level of signal. And this is what makes things tricky now. Because then you're comparing individuals who have different values of unobservables. And so, complicated. So if you want to use the test for test the null hypothesis of no bias, which is what the literature does, by estimating these uh, probabilities, which I haven't said how, but then we know that we're going to end up doing this via mar uh, uh, marginal treatment effects, then the test will have no size control, okay? Because under the null may over-reject, it will find, you know, the opposite inequality. So it doesn't control size. If you care about power, this test may have no power because, you know, even under the alternative may conclude that your things are the same. And if you think about confidence intervals and all these things that people typically present, they're all invalid. So you have a test that is useless. No size, no power. Just In general, and this is what matters, in the context of generalized Roy model, differences in probabilities at the margin are uninformative about difference in, in this function tau, which determines preferences, determines whether uh, judges are unbiased or not. So the generalized Royce model, you know, has been recently used to implement marginal outcome tests in a variety of papers. Well, hopefully our results raise concerns about the level of generality. So anyway, this is something to um, be concerned. Just to be clear, it's not saying that, you know, when you say, it's not saying that this paper is just, just wrong is just that you just put the, the findings in those papers are what they are. You just grab the data and you find certain probabilities of misconduct that are this and that. The data is the data. The estimation is the estimation. The question is, again, how do you interpret those results? You know, how much can you push this idea that your model is super general and doesn't restrict behavior, behavior meaningfully? 
that's the discussion. Whether you think that your results are coming from a model that restricts behavior uh, seriously or not. So I said related results here. Um, the results on the invalidity of marginal based outcome tests in the generalized road model are novel. We don't know if anybody that has done something like this before. However, if you just look at the literature, our results you know, are conceptually related to this paper by Brock et al. that I uh, mentioned later. Um, so um, the shared features is that, you know, essentially allowing for the taste of discrimination parameter to depend on an observable characteristics, you know, is complicated for this outcome test. You know, you, of course, you want to do that. Then the minute that you do it, you realize that there um, things become complicated. The main difference is that the Brock et al., Discuss lack of robustness in original results based on plus possibly restrictive models. The original papers that they are uh, dealing with impose this restriction from the get-go, right? And they're saying, like, what if you don't? What if you don't? What happens, okay? Uh, whereas in our case, we're just grabbing papers that are actually saying that you can allow these functions to depend on B, okay? And you still go and do an outcome test. And we're saying, oh, well, you can. And then... Uh, the formal arguments behind this paper and our papers are quite distinct. They have different driving forces. And then this issue about the conditional distributions um, completely plays a different role in both. I don't want to get into that. Let's just move on. Main result number two. And I don't think um, that, that we'll uh, finish everything today, but let's try. The main result number two says the following. You consider marginal outcome tests in the context of the standard Roy model, and the standard Roy model gives you a logically valid outcome test. So if you believe that the true model is the extended Roy model, things work, go ahead. You can test for bias, okay? And you can test for bias while still, you know, in principle, allowing for statistical discrimination, which in this model will be similar to having these signals of risk different for whites and blacks. So oh, there you go. You can use the extended Roy model. So those are the two formal results. Hopefully they're clear. If there are no questions, I'm going to keep going so that we can uh, see the end, okay? Sorry that I'm rushing, but I just um, wanted to get this through. What are the econometrics behind the marginal based outcome tests? Well, marginal based outcome tests require misconduct probability of the marginal white and marginal black defendant. And we have random assignments. So now we're going to bring back, so going back to Jose's question before, now we're going to be thinking about multiple judges, okay? And we're going to bring this, uh, um, you know, variation across judges to identify what we want. Whereas up until now, everything was about one judge, nothing to do with identification problems. It was just about the logic of the model. Now we're talking about identification. Well, we have random assignments. So that means that Z is independent of the variables that we observe and the potential outcomes. This is great. However, this is not enough to identify the quantities that we, are, uh, that we care about given the observed data, which doesn't include B. Okay? And in particular, uh, without further restrictions, if we focus on the generalized Roy model, without further restrictions, it's not possible to recover this probability of misconducts at the margin, okay? And the problem is that the model that we presented so far is restricts the behavior for a given judge, but it does not impose restrictions on how judges differ in their behavior. We need cross-judges restrictions to be able to identify these things in the data, okay? And one thing that I want to clarify, the issues that I described before, these limitations that we presented in the first formal result, are completely unrelated to having cross judges restrictions. Meaning, if we impose these additional assumptions that we are about to impose now, then you know you don't solve the problems that we had before. And then, as opposed to the generalized Roy model, if you just look at the extended Roy model, the extended Roy model gives you valid marginal treatment effects without the need of further assumptions. The reason is going to be the extended Roy model satisfies automatically the so-called monotonicity that we know uh, that we need to identify these marginal treatment effects. So, monotonicity. What is monotonicity in this context? It means this. Exogenous reassignment from one judge to another weakly increases the benefit function and thus the likelihood of release for every defendant of a given race. 
Okay. So now suppose that you have now, as I said, a continuous judges. And remember that we have one lecture where I said you can always relabel the Z's, the value of the Z's according to the propensity score. That means that we can relabel judges in an interval from zero to one from the the uh the mo the toughest judge to the most lenient one, the most you know, the hardest one, the one that is not gonna release people to the one more people, dependence. And so then what monotonicity is saying, if you are a defendant that got released by a judge that was more severe, then you're gonna be released by any judge that is uh, more lenient than the judge that you got. Okay. So in the same way, in the other way, like if you got detained by this lenient judge, you will be detained by any judge that is tougher than that. Okay. And again, we're not gonna discuss whether that makes sense or not. Of course, it's an assumption that kind of has been criticized and you can just talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I just want you to understand what it means. And the other thing that I want you to understand is that in the extended Roy model, it just happens automatically. Because look at this inequality. Inequality asks you for this tau to be uh, greater than or equal than the other tau for all values of B. In the context of the extended Roy model, B doesn't show up and choose about a, a, a sorting. Okay, if you different values have different values, different judges have different values of the function tau, just sort them according to the value of tau, and there's the same as sorting according to the propensity score. Monotonicity holds by relabeling. So monotonicity is key to obtain a valid MTE representation. We know this. We saw the uh, uh, paper in Bitlasil that uh, that said that you know you needed the Roy model to be separable in the unobservables and the observables to have uh, monotonicity. Okay, and so here is essentially what we're doing in this extended Roy model. And then once you have monotonicity, then you can just rewrite the model as a uniform and a propensity score. If you don't see how this happened, take the extended Roy model. In the extended Roy model, this is clear because we have the perspective value of Y1, R, and B. And this is the, the variable that is unobserved, less than or equal than tau z r. Well, I'll just compute the conditional CDF of B, conditional on all the other stuff, okay? Make this U, pass this to the other side, and you're gonna have a propensity. This is the same trick, right? And so once you have this, where is the marginal treatment effect? Is is the spectral value of y1 minus y0, which again, recall them, this model y0 is just zero. Condition on u given equal to little u and r being equal to r, and this is equal to this, okay? And so here, u being equal to little u is the same as b equal to just some b, b star. So that's where we're going to find the marginal person because the mapping from u to b is just one to one. And then you're going to have the marginal defendants at those that are like equal to a particular value of the propensity score. So the marginal treatment effect at the propensity score are just going to give us information about the probability of misconduct for the marginal defense. So we just go and grab this literature, even though I just went really quickly here. The reason why I went really quickly, aside from the fact that I had too much time to, to uh, too much material to cover, is that we already talk about marginal treatment effect. We devote an entire class about marginal treatment effects. You know how they work. And the only thing that I'm saying here is this class of Roy models that try to answer questions about discrimination. Just bring all that machinery that you know about marginal treatment effects and exploit them here to talk about bias. I want to conclude. So what we learned was the takeaway is that marginal based outcome tests work in the context of the extended Roy model, which is this model that I have over here. This model means that there are no forms of bias other than racial, it means that a biased judge must be equally biased against all defendants of the same race. And it means that judges' accuracies in predicting these probabilities cannot vary systematically with B. This is what I call earlier measurement error and so on. Um, there are a couple of features here. All this, 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 and this are typically disliked features of this model, right? So when you talk to an applied person, they don't like to make these assumptions because, you know, when you start thinking about these assumptions, they, at least in some context, they look like are, um, you know, are unlikely to hold. But 
what we're trying to clarify here, this is what you need for this to go through. Type of settings. Um, and claiming that you don't, and claiming that you can use a generalized Roy model, not something that you can defend. So that's the end of today's class. Sorry that it was so intense and long. Uh, but hopefully it gives you um, an overview of what this is about so that if you're interested, you can start reading papers on getting into this uh, by yourself. So next week, we're going to move to the second part of this class. And now I'm going to move to discuss questions. Thank <laughs> you.